start again. Good morning, DC. Is there anyone out here who is for statehood? I'm not convinced I don't hear it. Is anybody out here for statehood? Awesome. Well, what we're going to do collectively before I get into this invocation is we're going to sing the Black National Anthem, just the first stanza. Everybody knows the words, right? And y'all going to sing with me because I can't sing like that sister just sang right there. So we're going to sing together, all right? All right. Can I have a stand, please, in honor of this moment, in honor of this time? Ready. <clears throat> Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. I'm an alto. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Come on, y'all help me. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has brought us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us facing the rising sun of a new day begun. Let us march on till victory is won. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Y'all, that's, that's not my lane, but you know, when you ask the occupier, you just, you know, you stand ready. So y'all, thank you for your, your graciousness. You can be seated, and I'm going to just give us an invocation to get this morning started. Gracious, gracious God. We stand here this morning in collective spiritual and constitutional solidarity to add our voices to the demand for statehood for the District of Columbia. In this critical hour and at this particular time of need in our nation, with voting rights under attack, economic and climate instability all around, and domestic threats being planned in our city and carried out, God, we need to be able to make our own decisions, to protect our own residents, and to handle our own financial affairs separate and apart from congressional oversight or permission. We have demonstrated as a city we are up to that task. We need to erase the residual stench of low expectations and inability to self-govern that are rooted in Jim Crow era thinking. And most of all, God, we need to halt the systematic disenfranchisement of 700,000 voices of people who are majority people of color in the District of Columbia. D.C. statehood is a racial justice issue. There is no excuse, God. No excuse and no constitutional reason why D.C. can't be made a state today. Where there is a political will, there is a way. So we pray today and call upon President Biden and Congress to act. We pray that courage will override political calculation and that they will rise to the occasion and do what is right. We're closer, God, to statehood than we've ever been in history. Momentum is on our side. Dr. Martin Luther King said the time is always right to do what is right. And the time for D.C. statehood is now. Amen. All right, all right. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Okay, folks, how you all doing? Be sure to get some water. Okay, uh, now we're going to hear from the uh, Dr. Reverend H. Lionel Edmonds, from the, uh, who is the president of the Washington Interface Network. So, uh, Dr. Edmonds, please. All right, thank you so much. God bless everyone. The D.C. National Anthem is written by Chuck Brown 
and it's we feel like busting loose. Anybody know that? Let me hear you say it. Now let me see you drop it like it's hot. Okay, it's hot out here. We're here because we want to bust loose from colonialism. We want to bust loose from white superiority. We want to bust loose from what they inflict upon us as a people every minute of our lives. But the word says, he who the sun sets free is free indeed. We have already won because we're on the right side. We're on God's side. Each one of you represents 100 people, 500 people, 1,000 people. Each one of you can influence 100 people, 500 people, 1,000 people. Your words matter. Your actions matter. Don't worry about how many folks are here. Europeans count. White folk like to count. But we come from a people who go beyond what you see visibly into another realm. We are part of God's liberation movement. As Bob Marley said, Exodus, movement of the people. We have already won. But we got to stay on the battlefield and be vigilant. Spirituality is an expression of our individuality, of our relationship with our creator. Pharaoh Sanders says, the creator has a master plan. Peace and love throughout all the land. And we are a part of that master plan. So I salute you today, my brothers and sisters, children of the Most High, our Creator, Perfector, and Deifier. You are a part of the Creator's process of liberation, manifestation of His freedom throughout the universe. We will overcome. God bless you. Our next speaker we're blessed to have today is Dr. Talib Sharif. He is the president of the Mayor's Interfaith Council. Dr. Sharif, give him a praise clap. Thank you so much. Dr. Sharif, welcome. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, and that is with Almighty God's name, the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer. We always have to keep God first and foremost. We are here because of freedom, justice, and equality. Freedom, justice, and equality is an aspiration of every single human soul. And not only is it an aspiration of every single human soul, it is a full right of every single human soul. We are here to demand just that, that right. A resident of this city, Frederick Douglass, he said, I prayed for 20 years and received no answer until I prayed with my legs. Until I prayed with my legs. We are here today rallying and we're gonna be marching and he's basically saying when we begin to stand up and begin to move and begin to make demands, then the prayers will begin to be answered. When you think about marching, so don't just think about the legs. For at the bottom of the feet, they call it the soul, S-O-L-E. And that is really just a homonym of S-O-U-L. Because you have to have a S-O-U-L to be able to stand up. And it is our soul standing up, standing up for Almighty God for our full rights as residents, as citizens, as human beings. 
We need our rights in reforming this democracy and our rights as citizens of this nation and residents of D.C. So I'll close with this, if you can repeat after me. Statehood for D.C. 51st, right, full lead, full rights. Thank you. Next, I want to introduce a young man of God who's responsible, in fact, has done an outstanding job today of giving, getting all of our religious leaders out here, Reverend Dr. George Holmes. Round of applause for Dr. Holmes. Thank you for your patience, thank you for your time, and thank you for coming out here to be able to hear what God has to say to us. And we thank you so very much for all that you have done. Thank you for braising this hot sun. God be with you. So I want to ask all of our religious leaders that came out this morning to help us to stand up. Religious leaders, stand up. Let's give them a big praise clap. Thank you so very much. You could have been somewhere else, but you came here today to be with us, and you brought God Almighty with you. We can feel it, we can see it, and we know it. We thank you so very much, everybody. I'm honored now to bring a young lady who has done so much for people all across the country. Estime. Estime is the speaking on behalf of Every Life Matters. And I want all of the all the members of Every Case Matters to stand up. Give these ladies a big round of applause. They're not only standing up for the lives of our children who have been horrendously murdered all over the country, but they're standing up for D.C. statehood. And today they put D.C. statehood first over everything else that's going on in this city. And you all know there are a lot of things going on. But these ladies put D.C. statehood first. Give them a big round of applause. Ms. Estein Robinson and the ladies of Every Case Matters. Thank you, Estein. We want to just um, thank Senator Michael Brown and Representative Moreland for inviting us today. We want to give honor to God for the opportunity to bring us here. We stand in solidarity fighting for families across the country who have lost children and loved ones to police legalized state-sanctioned terrorism. And so we are here to stress the importance of not only fighting for these cases, but linking these cases. Because as we all know, we have been here for over 500 years under this brutal attack of genocide, red, black, and brown lives lost senselessly by law enforcement for no reason at all. And just the other day, we lost another young, beautiful man in D.C. And so this is happening all across the country, 33 lives a day, every day all across the country, a 1,000 almost every other six months. So needless to say, it is not enough to amplify individual cases. So why do we say every case matters? We say that simply because Ampl amplifying one or two cases is simply not going to solve this problem. We must link these cases and fight as a group. And so the mothers are here from across the country. They too have lost loved ones. They've lost children. We stand in solidarity together. And I just want you to repeat after me, every case matters. Every case matters. Every case matters. Every case what? Every case what? Every case what? Matters. Because every life matters. We are entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And we are entitled to it collectively. No more high profile cases and low profile cases. We are demanding that these cases be linked and opened period, in solidarity together across this country. There is no more high-profile case and a low-profile case. No more individual families that get the attention of the media and the masses go left behind unnoticed. 
That is what Every Case Matters stands for. We want you to sign our petition. We have nearly 500,000 signatures. Go to Justice for Aja and sign the petition. We are trying to get a million. We ask that you sign it today. I'm going to give the floor to our mothers. Briefly, they will say something on behalf of, of Every Case Matters and the, and the importance of you signing this petition. Good morning, everyone. I'm here from Detroit. I'm the mother of Adesha Miller. Killed one day before her 25th birthday by a Detroit police officer. And all she was doing was celebrating her life. But she was a victim of the system. 25 minutes before they call 911, only one call goes through. The prosecutor doesn't find anything wrong with it. She even cleared the officer of all wrongdoing when my daughter was killed at his house at his party with his service weapon while he was off duty. I want everybody to understand our children are murdered every day in every way under every excuse but it's always under the authority and the color of law, whether they're on duty or off duty, they're protected. Everybody needs to understand whether you have been a victim, you know a victim, or you are yet to be a victim. Everybody has to work together. This isn't a voluntary thing. We didn't volunteer to be where we are. You need to work with us, support us, and make the system change, because it's not going to do it on its own. That's why every case matters. That's why we ask you to sign a petition. It's a little thing to participate and just click send. We're not asking you to go out, find a poll, sign up after you wait in line. You can do this at your leisure. Share it to as many people as you know. And we want you to share it to everybody that you know. And then check back and see, did you sign the petition? We're giving you a little assignment today. Handle this little bit of business for us. Sign the petition, share the petition, and then check back and make sure that everybody you sent it to did. Because we all matter. so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now we're going to hear from Dr. Hornes. Uh, uh, actually, Reverend Holmes is going to come up right now and introduce a couple of folks. All right. Thank you so much. We got the dynamic, the charismatic, the magnificent. Say the magnificent. Reverend Dr. Carl Eugene Kills, president of Maple Springs Baptist College and Seminary. Good morning, good morning, and, and welcome, welcome to this rally for statehood. We thank God as a native Washingtonian, born, raised in Washington, D.C., taught in D.C. public schools, graduated three times from Howard and one time from the University of the District of Columbia. I know how important statehood is to this city. I can remember when we had the three commissioner system in which we had no rights and that the people that actually lived in the city were disenfranchised. And I still feel that in so, some ways that we're still disenfranchised because we're not able to share in the rights of other Americans being able to determine our own destiny. And so I am here as a representative of the clergy of this vast city to say we support this endeavor in any way we can. And if God be on high, God knows that injustice anyway is injustice everywhere. And so as the president of Maple Springs Baptist Bible College and Seminary, I support this effort and we ask now that you all tell a friend, tell a neighbor that DC statehood is 
and will be a reality in this new year. May God bless you and heaven smile upon you. We surely thank Dr. Kiel. Give him another round of applause. Now I know you've been waiting for this next speaker. See, I've been waiting. I've been, well, you've been waiting for the great, the none other, the Reverend Dr. E. Gail Anderson Holness. Dr. Holness come as the president, the former president of the Democratic Women Club and the pastor at Adams Inspirational AME Church. I give to you no other than E. Gail Anderson Holness. Good morning, D.C. Good morning to the 51st state. Washington, District of Columbia, we, come on, raise your flag this morning. When I think about his goodness and all that he's done for me, my soul shouts, hallelujah. I know what he has done. I know what God can do. I remember that trip that my ancestors made through that diaspora from 1619. I Remember my brothers and sisters who were a part of the Holocaust. I remember my brothers and sisters who have died through gun violence. But when I think about his goodness and all that he's done for all of us, we can become the 51st state. We can become the 51st state. We know what it's like to be disenfranchised. We knew, know what it's like to deal with the investitudes of systemic slavery, systemic racism. We know what it's like when our education system is attacked. We know what it's like to lose family members to COVID and old age and cancer and lupus and sickle cell and high blood pressure. But when I think about his goodness, and all that he's done for us. I believe that all things are possible, D.C., if we just believe we want a green earth and we want justice to roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Let's go get our new flag. Let's become that 51st state. But let's not leave God out of the plan. God bless us, D.C. Praise God for our faith leaders. With God by our side, we're in the majority. And with God by our side, we're going to win. We cannot lose. The next singer is a young man who was introduced to us by Every Case Matters. Mr. Carl Freaking, give him a big round of applause. Carl, thank you so much. Thank you, Carl. Many blessings and much love to everyone here. Um, yeah, my mother is Ishtan Robinson, and she brought me out here today. I uh, just want to bless you guys with a few words, uh, a song, and hopefully this brings peace and love to everyone out there. Mother, mother, there's so many of you crying. Brother, 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 there's far too many of you dying. You know we've got to find a way to bring some loving here today. Father, Father, there's no need to escalate. See, war is not the answer, for only love can conquer You know we've got to find a way to bring some love in here today. Picky line. And picket signs Don't punish me With brutality Come on, talk to me So that you can see 
What's going on? Yes. Thank you and God bless. Okay, folks, how you all doing? Be sure to get some water here. Let me just put a quick plug. You know that the earthquake in Haiti is devastating thousands of people. They went through an earthquake in 2010 that killed more than 100,000 people. I'm not clear. I don't forget the number. This uh, earthquake was devastating for a country that was already having all kinds of challenges. So please keep Haiti not only in your prayers, but also in your pockets. There's an organization called GSI Haiti that you can go online and search. They're making a great efforts to get them some relief. If you go online, you'll be able to make a donation. Please don't forget the folks in Haiti. Now we're going to introduce. All right, yeah, and we've been honored to uh, be joined here by Dr. Barber, Reverend ba Dr. Barber, right there. So we're, let's make sure that we applaud. Put your hands up for uh, Dr. Reverend uh, Barber, who is right here with us, and he'll be uh, shortly speaking to us. Now I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, Reverend Holmes, who is going to come up to this podium and grace us with his wonderful lectures. Come on, Dr. Uh God be the glory. Again, I just want to let everybody know that we've been honored and blessed by the entry of Reverend Dr. George Barber, who's here. All right, guys. Okay, how we doing? When I say DC, you say stay here. DC. DC, wonderful, wonderful. So I told you about Haiti. Please don't forget that. We also want to make sure that we pray for our troops. These are difficult times, folks, and that's why we're here in this wonderful place right now. This place that has been the home to a lot of struggle, uh, including that of statehood. And as we say, we're not only going to hope for statehood, we're going to make sure it takes place. We're going to get the House. We have the House passage of our bill, H.R. 51. Now we're going to work hard to get the Senate to do the same. Statehood now is what we need. All right, thank you, folks. Be sure to get some water. And please, folks, as you come through, uh, be sure to leave this area uh, clear because right now we're being live streamed and the, uh, the cameras are uh, getting us captured, so we're trying to get this area clear. So if you can, please just go around uh, towards the rear. We would be greatly appreciative of, of that effort. Uh, yeah, and let me just uh, real quick before we uh, bring our next speaker, let me go ahead and say uh, that this has been an incredible uh, labor of love, uh, putting this together, and I want to make sure that I thank uh, some incredible people that have put up. Uh, this took about three months to put together, believe it or not, and people like Vern uh, and Shelley who are here, uh, obviously uh, uh, our for first uh, U.S. Representative Charles Moreland, uh, it was his vision to put this together, and so I thank him so much for inviting me to be part of this. We also had uh, the Honorable Senator uh, Michael Brown, who you'll hear from in a, in a few moments. All right, and now we're going to go ahead and be uh, honored with the presence of uh, our uh, Senator, Senator Michael Brown. Uh, I believe he is here. I know he was here a few minutes ago. Here we go. All right. Here we go. Our senator, who is working incredibly hard. We are so proud of the work you're doing, Senator. Thank you so much, not only for putting your uh, foot on this uh, to get us the permit that, that we now have, but also for all the work you're doing with your radio show and going on the Hill uh, in the Senate without a vote and making sure that we get as many co-sponsors to our uh, Senate bill. We are so grateful for all the work you're doing. I give you the Honorable uh, Senator Michael Brown. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming. We're here gathered today uh, on the anniversary of the seminal moment in the history 
of the American Civil Rights Movement. Dr. King stood on the mall a few feet away from where we are now and told us of his dream 58 years ago. Uh, it's an exciting time for us. We know, as Dr. King taught us, that the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice. What he didn't say and what we have to know is that how quickly it depends, how quickly it bends depends on how many of us are willing to stand up and temper it and make it bend. This is an exciting time for us, um, we hate, but we still have much work to do. You'll hear a lot of people say that we're closer to statehood than we've ever been before. And in some ways that's true. We have a statehood bill that's passed the House of Representatives and that's never happened. And we have a statehood bill in the United States Senate that has 46 co-sponsors. But don't make any mistake, we're only at the 50 yard line. We have a lot more work to do. We've been here before. In the 1970s, we had a constitutional amendment which passed both houses of Congress and never became law. Uh, a decade ago, we had a voting rights amendment that would have given us a vote in the House that passed both houses of Congress and never became law. So we have work to do, but the path is very, very clear. The first thing we need to do is we need to remind Senator Manchin of West Virginia that he's a Democrat and that Democratic values demand that he stand with us and enfranchise the 700,000 people of the District of Columbia. Then we need to go and talk, you know, and we can drive to West Virginia and make our point if we have to. But then we have to go and talk to the senator from Arizona and assure her, Senator Sinema, Sinema that the people of Washington, D.C. who pay taxes and fight in wars have every right to citizenship as the people of Arizona. We need to march. We need to go into the streets. I've been arrested. I've gone to trial. And we need to do more of that. And then we need to suspend the rule. We need to suspend the filibuster or get rid of the filibuster. If you cannot suspend the filibuster for something as basic as the most basic right of citizenship, representation, then the rule becomes an instrument of tyranny, and that has to end. We need a greater presence, a greater effort. There should be 50,000 of us out here today, not just a handful. So you need to get everybody you know, every neighbor, every friend, every relative, and get them to stand up for D.C. statehood. We need leadership in this movement. We need people that are willing to stand up and lead us to where we need to be. Your senators shouldn't be volunteers. This shouldn't be a hobby. This should be a full-time endeavor. You know that six other states elected senators like me, uh, and they all become they all, territories, and they all became states, each and every one of them. The only exception to the rule is the District of Columbia, and we need to end that. We need to have a unified force, and that's what the Douglas Commonwealth Coalition is all about. It's an attempt to unify us and get us moving in the right direction. You know, Frederick Douglass taught us that power can seize nothing without a demand. A demand takes a lot of people, and we're not making a demand, and we have to do that. My favorite quote from the Old Testament is Ecclesiastes. To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under heaven. This is our time, and we must seize it. So I'm going to make you a great offer. You're never going to get a better offer than this. If you help change the situation in the District of Columbia and make us a state, you will not only enfranchise 700,000 people, you will enfranchise millions and millions and millions of Washingtonians to come, because no state has ever had their statehood revoked. So once it happens, it's permanent. You know, you shouldn't be disenfranchised because of your color. You shouldn't be disenfranchised because of your income. You shouldn't be disenfranchised by your party affiliation or your political belief. And you sure as hell shouldn't be disenfranchised because of your zip code. We need to change that. 
The first meeting I ever had with our delegate, Eleanor Holmes Norton, she told me nothing, nothing, nothing is ever generated within the walls of Congress. Everything comes from pressure from the outside, and we're the pressure that we have to exert on the outside. We have to engage the Democrats. Every Republican in America stands against us, yet the Democrats don't give enough attention to this issue. They should be for two more Democrats in the Senate, just for the same reason the Republicans are against two more Democrats in the Senate. We have to convince America that their agenda is our agenda. Imagine how much more we could do with two liberal Democrats from the District of Columbia in the United States Senate. That's why Every Case Matters is here today, because Every Case Matters is an issue that we care about. Global warming is an issue that we care about. Guns is an issue that we care about. But unfortunately, our voices are silenced, and we need to change that. We need to convince America. So we're a small group here today, but we need to go out on the mall as we march to the Lincoln Memorial and make sure that everybody sees us and everybody hears us. So let me get you to say it. What do we want? Statehood. When do we want it? What do we want? When do we want it? What do we want? When do we want it? Thank you very much, and God bless each and every one of you. Wonderful. Big applause for the Senator Michael Brown, folks. Thank you so much. Folks, we have some T-shirts right over there, so be sure they're all sizes, so be sure to grab one when we get ready at 1030 to march. Now, it gives me great pleasure. You all know I was your, uh, I'm your former U.S. Uh, representative, and we are so honored uh, today to be joined by my replacement, who became the first Nigerian American elected to the U.S. House, and we're going to make sure that he gets a vote by becoming the 51st state. So I give you the Honorable Oye Owelawa. Thank you so much, Oye. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So greetings, D.C. residents, tourists, activists, and everybody who's concerned about our fight for equality. Before I begin, I want us all to just take in this moment that 58 years ago, the greatest American who has ever lived delivered the I Have a Dream speech. That in 1963, millions of people were upset and hundreds of thousands of black people marched on Washington to demand better civil and economic rights. Since 1963, we've seen so much progress. We've witnessed historical elections, the integration of all academic institutions, and the emergence of black culture, not only nationally, but internationally as well. But today, we're here because we are seeing that even though we're 58 years past the I Am A Dream speech, there is so much more work to be done. Here in the United States, we are witnessing the widening of the income gap, the depth of the achievement gap, historic inequalities in healthcare and criminal justice and every type of institution that we have here in America. What I see is a product of a broken democracy. That we're here in America where the Senate has become the deathbed, the graveyard of common sense legislation. Where senators hide behind the filibuster to continue to profit from the status quo. That we have activists today that care about climate justice, income inequality, racial justice, health care reform, voting rights, and D.C. statehood. What I see to cure these societal ills is to complete our democracy. And the only way to do that is to elevate 
the 700,000 Americans living in our nation's capital by achieving D.C. statehood. And if you care about any of these issues, and you fight for any of these issues, you notice that we have something in common. The same roadblock, the same hurdle, the same few senators that find themselves in our way. Well, here on August 28th, 2021, we're gonna find a way to get them out of our way by any means necessary. While some wanna go lobby in senators' offices because we don't like the way they do things, we have a little strategy of our own in DC. That we get bad service, we don't go to employees. We reach out to their bosses. So when we see Senator Manchin hide behind a filibuster, we're not going to his chambers. We're going to Morgantown, West Virginia to talk to his voters. This is an opportunity for us to raise our voices and raise our votes and bring the change. But we can only get DC statehood if we work together. So there's a two part plan. So for all the tourists, and visitors and people who care about us but don't live in DC, we need you to reach out to your neighbors. We need you to activate your elected officials. We need you to challenge all the people running for office. Because statehood is a national issue, not a regional, not a local one. For us DC residents, we have to understand that statehood is not just about voting representation. It's also our ability to self-govern, to make our own laws, to control our own budget, to keep ourselves safe from lynch mobs coming down to our capital or white supremacists leaving bombs outside of our libraries. We must fight like our lives depend on this because it actually does. As DC residents, we must also make sure that our voices are paramount in this issue. We can no longer rely on elected officials that are not from DC, that don't represent DC, that tell our story. It's our time to tell our story. When we're in the news, they should be talking to us, not just elected officials, but people in the audience that live in DC. Because this is your story, this is your fight. We're going to make this happen. So in closing, I am Dr. Oye Wolowa, U.S. Representative of Washington, D.C., and I have one more comment. Today, we don't have a congressional vote, but we do have a say. Let's use our say to get D.C. statehood. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you. U.S. Representative Oye Wolowa. Uh, United, we will be a state. Divided, we will remain disenfranchised. I'm honored to call next from the Metropolitan Washington Labor Council, Diana Forrester. Diana Forrester, let's give her a big hand. Diana. Okay, big round of applause for Diana Forrester. Show your love. Good morning on this beautiful, hot, bright and shiny day. I'm Deanna Forster. I'm the president of the Metro Washington Labor Council, AFL-CIO. And when we're here and we're talking about voting rights, and I looked at my sister, Egil Holness, we used to serve as ANC commissioners together. And on my reelection, I barely made it. At the, when I went to bed that night, there was um, a the person who won was 10 votes over when I was an ANC commissioner. And then when I woke up, I won. After that, there was a recount. After that, they had to do what was called a casting of the lots at noon, high noon. <laughs> no one knew what it was because there was one vote that kept us apart from winning. Saying all that, being reminded of that as I see my fellow ANC commissioner, that every vote matters, right? 
And we believe as citizens of this country that that is our access to creating the society that we want to see. And when I listen to the people that oppose D.C. having a right to a vote in Congress and their arguments, the arguments meaning that one, it was never meant for D.C. to have a vote. We were never supposed to be a state. And the people that say those things also said that me as a black woman, a Mexican woman, did not have the right to vote, should not have the right to vote. Those same people believe that women should not have the right to vote. So if we are going to continue along these lines that D.C. doesn't deserve statehood because that's not what the founders of the Constitution wanted for us. Or if we can continue with this argument that we can't allow D.C. to be a state because there are too many Democrats here. So what is the value of voting? Because voting is supposed to be our constitutional rights as citizens. It's not political. And when I hear that argument, what I remind people to say is when we all when all of our vote counts, we all have a say in Congress. That's what democracy looks like. So I'll speak as a union leader who won a historical election for president July 2015. Anybody a part of a union? Do you know how we form our unions? Because we collectively bargain with workers against the powers that be. That's what democracy looked like. I'm also proud that those unions, over 150 unions in the D.C. metropolitan area, elected me to serve them as the youngest president of the Metro Washington Labor Council. Amen, amen. I'm honored to be here with you. We have taken this fall to Capitol Hill. The AFL-CIO endorsed statehood. Our Alaska AFL-CIO has turned out and supported statehood. In a couple of, in about an hour or so, we're going to see our brothers and sisters from SEIU 32BJ, 1199, um, AFG, Ask Me, march down this street because we're taking it to the Capitol to say that in order for us to have, to protect our voting rights, that D.C. also has to have statehood. And it's not an and or. So with that being said, I'm proud to be here with you all and look forward to continuing the fight. Thank you. All right, all right, all right. Give it up for this proud Afro-Latina with the uh, Metro Labor Council. Thank you so much, Diana. And now we're going to hear from our young people. We have the youth mayors. We have uh, Addison Rose and Lourdes Robinson. Please come up and uh, take a minute to uh, greet the audience here. Good morning, my name is Addison Rose and I'm a 16 year old junior um, and one of the youth mayors as stated. Now is the accepted time, not tomorrow, not some more convenient season, a quote by W.E.B. Du Bois. Today I stand here amongst you all as a regular 16 year old girl with dreams and aspirations like anyone else, dreams of a promising future. Honestly, as I reflect upon my hopes and dreams for this country, I get a little sad. Sad because so much time has been taken from us. Now is the time it is imperative for us to take action. The one time we have a Democratic House, a Democratic Senate, and a Democratic President. The first in eight years we have all three branches. This is now the time. Over 400 years ago, we were brought here and had no rights. It took 346 years for the first Voting Rights Act to become law, yet we still have a host of subversive tactics and bills being passed to suppress voters. There is also the pressing issue of the main reason most of us are here today, D.C. statehood. D.C. citizens pay the most in federal taxes per capita in the nation and even have a higher population than states like Vermont and Wyoming, yet for some reason people believe our voices don't matter. So it is time that we call senators, rally, and march, really push to help lawmakers understand that we have a right to a voice. 
We have a right to a vote in the Senate, and we have a right to equality in our country. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lourdes Robinson. I am a 15-year-old rising sophomore, and I am the newly elected DC youth mayor. Taxation without representation. You've seen it on license plates, banners, campaigns, etc. Making DC a state is unconstitutional. What's unconstitutional is that for more than 200 years, allowing DC and its residents to have responsibilities of statehood, serving in juries, paying federal taxes, contributing to our national economy, serving in the military, and et cetera, then subjecting them to systemic inequality, denying them full rights of citizenship and the privileges that other Americans in other states have, such as voting representation in Congress. You can't scream democracy and exclude and disenfranchise 700 plus thousand people, especially our black and brown people. Understand the significance of the movement. Advocate, be at the forefront and demand for our rights. Representation does not equate to having a representative who can propose bills and can't vote on them. Then letting non-DC senators vote and dictate our livelihoods. That's unconstitutional. Today, the push for statehood continues. Let this day mark the day that we get statehood for DC. Thank you. All right, all right. Thank you so much for our youth mayor. Thank you so much. And now we're going to hear from uh, Mr. Gregory McCarthy with the Statehood DC Research. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Statehood now. Good morning. It's really great to follow our two deputy youth mayors. Don't you feel good about the future knowing that those are our future mayors? Well, thank you. Like you, I'm here today because I love my country, but I'm also mad at my country for denying me equal rights and justice. And that's what a good citizen does. When you're patriotic, you dissent and you speak up. Because we know, as Dr. King and others said, the powerful don't give us justice out of the goodness of their hearts. They give us justice because they feel the power of the people that want it. And that's what today is all about. I work with some businesses in the region, some employers, and in addition to you, we feel the injustice that we, that we get with a lack of self-determination and non-statehood. But there are also some important economic and fiscal issues that we need to focus on. Let's be really clear. Lack of democracy and non-statehood is a jobs killer in this region. It's a jobs killer. It inhibits employers for hiring people and making thriving and, and happy district residents. And it's the private sector that's going to help sustain our economy and grow our tax base and allow our government to do the good things that we wanted to. So when you're marching today, in addition to fairness and justice, also know you're marching for a stronger economy, more jobs, better city finances, and a better region to work and live in. Thank you very much, and God bless you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mr. Gregory. Now we're going to quickly hear from somebody that needs no introduction, Anise Jenkins, Mr. Ms. D.C. Statehood. Here we go, Anise. Anise Jenkins, the soul and spirit of D.C. Statehood. Right. Welcome, Anise. Thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. We have a movement, y'all. We have a real movement, and it's moving. One that sustains itself, revives itself. We have strong shoulders to lean on. Those shoulders carried us thus far. We have been boosted by Julius Hobson. Hilda Mason, and others too numerous to mention who have gifted us with the movement, some of whom you do not know, all whose names belong in the history books, names of people who have kept us in this fight for freedom and equality, turned us from the path of taxation without representation, people who taught us that we were better than that. America is better than that. People who walked in the path of Martin Luther King, like Jesse Jackson and John Lewis. I know if we were not black or brown, we would not have to be in this struggle. But we are now seeking justice and equality that we have strongly inherited, that we now fight nonviolently with action. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Anise. And folks, we've been joined by our mayor. You're going to hear from her shortly. But first, let's go ahead. We have also been honored by the presence uh, of the president and CEO of the NAACP, the distinguished gentleman, Derek Johnson. If you can please come up. Please. Thank you.
Good morning. You know, as individuals convene on the Mall, whether it's the Lincoln Memorial or otherwise, and talk about the right to vote, I think it's a key, whether it's the John Lewis Reauthorization Act, whether it's to reverse the vote suppression methods that we've seen enacted by state legislative bodies across the country over the last three months. But we cannot forget and leave out D.C. statehood. The right to vote is a right to our voice. And what we recognize in this city, that the residents have not had a voice. You pay more in taxes per capita than the majority of the states in the country. That you are the reason why this nation keeps moving. And yet, you still lack a voice in Congress. So the NAACP for long have supported D.C. statehood because we support the right to vote. We support protection of that vote. And anyone who say they support voting rights and they don't support D.C. statehood, they don't support voting rights. So as we stand here this morning, as we prepare to march to the mall, we will stand in unison with you, the NACP, to say D.C. statehood is a priority. It is not a secondary issue. It is absolutely important that the residents of D.C. have a voice in Congress. I want to thank Mayor Bowser for keeping this movement alive. I want to thank Frank Smith, one of the SNCC original organizers who fought and risked his life for the right to vote. I want to thank Beverly Peverly for Perry for all of her leadership and Eugene Kinlo for keeping this issue moving forward. So whether you live in New York or California or North Carolina or Mississippi, D.C. statehood is a priority. Because if it's not a priority, you don't really believe in the right to vote. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you so much. I'm honored to introduce our next guest, who is the president and founder of Veterans United for D.C. statehood, Mr. Hector Rodriguez. Hector. And ladies and gentlemen, I have been given the honor of introducing you one great first citizen of Washington, D.C., Mayor Muriel Elizabeth Bowser. All right? She is serving as the eighth mayor of the District of Columbia since 2015, a member of the Democratic Party. She previously pre uh, represented Ward 4 as a member of the Council of the District of Columbia from 2007 to 2015. She is the second female mayor of the District of Columbia after Sharon Pratt and the first woman to be reelected to that position. Let's hear that today. Okay. She is the youngest of six children of Joe and Joanne Bowser. Mayor Bowser was born in Washington and grew up in North Michigan Park in Northeast Washington. She graduated from Chatham College in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania with a bachelor's degree in history and she gra graduated from the American University's School of Public Affairs with a master. Now, there's something very special about this mayor. She, uh, she has adopted a baby whom she has named Miranda. Let's hear it for Miranda. And let's hear it, ladies and gentlemen, for a formidable, a formidable, formidable achiever of Washington, D.C., Mayor Muriel Elizabeth Bowser. When I say D.C., you say statehood. D.C. D.C. When I say free D.C., you say free D.C. Free D.C. Free D.C. Let's try that again. Free D.C. Free D.C. So I want to 
to say thank you to the Douglas Commonwealth Coalition for hosting this rally today and gathering us on the beautiful Freedom Plaza in front of the State House for the future state of Washington, D.C. We have a busy day ahead of us commemorating the March on Washington. We stand here in Freedom Plaza. Freedom Plaza inspired itself by Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. Dr. King, we are told, pinned that speech right here in the Willard Hotel that's behind us. We walk on streets in Washington, D.C., paved in the history of our fight for statehood, paved in our history of our fight for civil rights for all Americans. And we have a duty, an obligation as Washingtonians to not only be part of that history, but to stand here and fight and stand up so that history is perfected. As 700,000 Washingtonians are enfranchised, and the only way to do that is to become the 51st state. Are you with me? I want to thank all the members of the coalition. I want to recognize the first woman not only to lead this city, but to be a big city mayor of any American city, Mayor Sharon Pratt. Where is Sharon Pratt? Right there by you, Ms. Mayor. Yep, there she is. Give her a big round of applause. I saw her. I said, we got to have Sharon Pratt. And you talking about a woman who would stand up, get arrested, and speak up for D.C. statehood more eloquently than anybody that I know, that is Sharon Pratt. I also want to thank all of our national civil rights organizations for recognizing that you can't talk about voter suppression without talking about the suppression of the black and brown vote right here in Washington, D.C., because we do not have two senators. So today, we're going to march, we're going to speak up, we're going to tell 100 people in the Senate that they cannot stand in the way. Oh, excuse me. We're going to tell 10 people in the Senate that they cannot stand in the way of our birthright. And that is to be represented in that Congress, to have a vote in the House, and to have two senators speaking up and voting for us. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. So now it is my, my great pleasure to be able to introduce our next speaker who stands up, speaks up for poor people across our country and make sure that we have the votes. This is an important time, people. We all are watching the news. We see what is happening in state houses around our country. It's a last gasp, that's what I call it. That's right, that's right. It's a last gasp to, to, to fight for white supremacy, to have deniers of our history have us destined to repeat it. So we have to stand in that breach right now to say never again, no more. We demand the vote, and we demand to be the 51st state in our union. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Reverend Barber. As I was standing there listening to the mayor, I was reminded in, that 58 years ago, Mayor Pratt, Mayor Bowser, not one woman was allowed to speak on the main stage. 58 years later, we got two powerful women mayors who have led and are continuing to lead this country in the way of justice. Madam Mayor and all Washingtonians, let me go straight to the matter. Isaiah chapter 10, verses 1 says, Woe unto those who legislate evil and rob the poor of their rights. Amen. There's been a robbery for over 200 years in America. And what we see today going on with all this voter suppression, yes, it's an attack a racial attack, but it's also bigger than that. 
It's a very attack on our democracy. If you look at these bills that are being passed, 49 states have passed them. They're passing them where you have a majority of black people, and they're passing them where you have hardly any black people. Because when you look inside the bills, those bills will block 56 million Americans from using access to the ballot they used last year. They hurt black people. They hurt brown people. They hurt Asian. They hurt native. They hurt white people. They hurt disabled people, they hurt working people, they hurt poor people. Because this is not Jim Crow, this is James Crow Esquire. And he is after the complete silencing of the progressive voice in this country. And so we got to make sure that we talk about statehood in that moral atmosphere. Why must we have statehood? For more than 200 years. The residents of Washington, D.C. have been robbed. I didn't say a thief came in, a robber. A thief is different than a robber. A thief is sneaky. But a robber will take your rights right in front of you. Amen. It's been a robbery. You've been subjected to systemic inequality and denied full rights of citizenship that the residents of states enjoy all over this country. Now let's be honest about it. We know one of the reasons slavery, one of the reasons that DC was never granted statehood was because of slavery. Because slavery stayed legal in DC until 1862. And the power forces never, even after slavery, wanted the former servants to be citizens citizens that had the rights and responsibility of citizenship. Washington's residents pay more taxes, according to the research, than residents in 22 states and pay per, more per capita to the federal government than any other state. And yet you don't have a voting Congress. Since World War I, according to the research, D.C. has sent 200,000 brave men and women to defend democracy abroad, most of them black. 2,000 have died and never came home. And yet those that came home went to fight for other people's right to vote and came back home and did not have that right in their own city. D.C. has 712,000 plus residents. That's more than Vermont. Vermont's a, a state. That's more than Wyoming. Wyoming's a state. It's comparable to Delaware. They, got, they have a state. They have senators, congresspersons. Alaska. The House passed statehood a few years ago, but the non-constitutional filibuster used by McConnell and Manchin. And you know, we talk about that too limited too. Filibuster didn't just hurt black people. The filibuster blocked anti-slavery laws, but it also was used to block women's suffrage. It was used to block labor rights. It was used to block consumer protection. It was even used to block a bill that would have guaranteed women health care and that they could purchase contraceptives with their health care plan but the people that used the filibuster to block the women's contraceptive approved men's Viagra. Come on, the filibuster has been bad. And if D.C., why we got to have it is because if D.C. had two senators, what if we had statehood? D.C. would have two senators, and you wouldn't have old Joe Manchin, one vote, being able to block for the People's Act and the voting rights restoration. He wouldn't be able to block $15 living wage that would lift 32 million poor and low workers out of poverty into higher income, many thousands of them in D.C. You wouldn't have Senator McConnell being the senator who gives corporations $2 trillion tax breaks and over $1.5 trillion during this pandemic and who forced a bill that was passed, and 84% of all the money in the first pandemic bill went to corporations. 
if D.C. had statehood, that wouldn't be our political reality. You wouldn't have a McConnell who will cheat to put people on the Supreme Court and not stop people from being put in graves. You wouldn't have him putting Supreme Court justices on the bench with 51 votes, but refusing to save the democracy and voting rights with 51 votes. That's what we would have. But here's the last point, because I'm a preacher that doesn't just like to curse the darkness. I want to talk about how can we. How do we get statehood? Now, Madam Mayor, I will suggest to you today that some folk, even that look like us, ain't going to like me talking like this. But I'm going to do what the Lord. There are 58 members of the Black Caucus. And there are 100 members of the Progressive Caucus. And in the Senate, we've got two black senators. Now, we have watched two cinemas, Manchin and, Sen Manchin and Cinema, with two votes, hold up everything. Y'all see where I'm going? We've watched two senators hold up everything. We got 58 black members of the Black Caucus, yes, sir. Yes, sir. 100 members of the Progressive Caucus, yes, sir. and two black senators. What if those 158 members of the United States Congress yes, sir. were to say, you can't get our 160 votes until you do right by D.C., right. until you pass the Voting Rights Act, Amen. until you pass the For the People's Act, till you raise the living wage to 15. You don't get your tax cuts. You don't get your infrastructure until we get our statehood. You don't get your infrastructure till we get our voting rights. Now, we will give you infrastructure, because we want infrastructure too. But you can't have that and then destroy the infrastructure of our democracy and the infrastructure of our daily lives. Now. Somebody say, but Reverend, that's playing hardball. Well, why in the hell everybody else get to play hardball? I think after 200 years, it's hardball time. Why do they get to play hardball and it's called politics? When we play hardball, it's called, well, we're not, we're not respecting the order. Somebody said to me the other day when I suggested this, they said, Mayor, then we won't get anything. But if the thing you get doesn't get your statehood, doesn't get your voting rights, doesn't get your living wages, what do you really have? And somebody said, you have to have activist politics. And you're going to have to have a moral shutdown. We got to get like the street in the halls of Congress. If we don't get it, shut it down. Hmm? You said, Reverend Bobby, that's radical. Well, when we wanted freedom for South Africa, people protested every day in D.C. for two years. You can't get this stuff with one rally on an anniversary day. It took 381 days in Montgomery. From Selma to Montgomery, Diane Nash didn't come to the March on Washington. She went to Selma and organized for two years before John Lewis and, and, and others ever came there. And it took from January to August to get the Voting Rights Act. Eight months! The March on Washington was a day, but it grew out of the Birmingham campaign, which was weeks. And then it continued. That's why Dr. King at the end, he never said, just come back to D.C. He said, go back to Alabama. Go back. go back to Mississippi. In other words, go back and build movements from the bottom up. So if we want statehood, Madam Mayor, we can have it. But we got to organize to have it. And we got to come together. We got to have politicians willing to play hardball politics, just like Manchin is playing, just like Cinema is playing. If, and and we, we can have it if we refuse to accept taxation without representation. We can have it if we make this a moral issue 
We can have it if we organize for it. Can I preach and take my seat? How did Moses beat Pharaoh? He organized for it. How did Joshua bring down the walls of Jericho? He organized for it. How did David bring down Goliath? He organized five rocks so he could get his cousins too. How did Esther defeat the plan against her people? She organized for it and said, if, my, if I perish, I perish. But I'm going to see the king. How did the apostles challenge Caesar? They had a Pentecost and recruited people and organized for it. How did Harriet Tubman get slaves out of slavery and build an underground railroad? She organized for it. How did Frederick Douglass have an abolition movement? He organized for it. A. Philip Randolph said it like this. It's not what people give you. It's what you organize to take. Nothing counts but pressure, 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 and more pressure. You can get what you can take, and you can keep what you can hold. If you can't take anything, you won't get anything. And if you can't hold anything, you won't keep anything. And you can't take anything unless you organize. And so it's got to start right here in D.C. Those, if you want it, start organizing. Not just on the anniversary of the march, but every day. Send the signal to those 58 black members and those 100 and progressive members. We tired of y'all telling we voted for it, but it died in the filibuster. Hold up mansion stuff. Hold up cinema stuff. Hold up McConnell stuff. And like, like Langston Hughes, uh, D.C. has got to say, America has never been America to me, but I swear this oath that America will be. And so, Madam Mayor, since this is the chocolate city, <laughs> and I know the folk around here kind of hip, let me say it like this. <laughs> let me say it like the rapper Mystical said it. It's time for D.C. to say to America and to the Congress, you keep bumping me up against the wall. But trust me, you ain't seen bouncing back yet. It's time to bounce back. It's time to fight back. It's time to march back. It's time to fight back. It's time to bounce back. I wish DC would stand up and say, you've been bumping me against the wall, but you ain't seen nothing yet. You ain't seen bouncing back yet. Bounce back, DC, and let's win statehood. Thank you so much, everybody. We got in 60 seconds, we're going to line up and march down 14th Street to the Lincoln Memorial. Everybody, in the meantime, please give Reverend Barber and our mayor a big round of applause. Thank you all so very much. I also want to thank all the members of the Douglas Commonwealth Coalition. Raise your hands and all the volunteers that helped put this together. Amen, and thank amen. you so very much for y'all statehood supporters. I love statehood supporters. And let me announce today that this is the largest statehood rally I have ever seen at Freedom Plaza. And that is in the midst of COVID-19 and a hot day in August. Thank you all so very much. Please immediately go to 14th Street and let's march down to the Lincoln Memorial. Thank you everybody so very much. Statehood, statehood, statehood now. Statehood.